Shares for beginners. Phil Muscatello and Finpods are authorized reps of Money Sherpa. The information in this podcast is general in nature and doesn't take into account your personal situation. The main driver of your return long term is how you combine your investments. It's very important, of course, what investments you choose to invest your money in. But then the second step is how do you combine them? Because the way you combine them will impact your return and will also impact your risk. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners. I'm Phil Muscatello. How much do stocks go up and down by over time? How can that information be measured and used to calculate the risk that you're comfortable in taking to achieve your future returns? Joining me today is Dr. Laura Rusu from Diverseview. G'day, Laura. Hello, Phil. And thank you for Hello. inviting me to Shares for Beginners. Oh, no worries. No problems at all. But I really like the idea of Diversifu as a concept and as a product and a service. And I just wanted to go through and work out some first principles here. And these are some of the concepts that Diversifu use to measure diversification and also to measure portfolio optimization. So let's start with a simple explanation of risk and volatility. Is it simply how much a stock goes up and down by? So first, let's say that you can have volatility in other asset classes as well. So you can have volatility in property, you can have volatility in crypto, of course. But because we are now speaking about shares for beginners, let's let's use the stocks as examples. People use these two terms, risk and volatility, interchangeably. And they are, of course, very much related, but there are some slight differences. So let's explain. Each investment, including shares, of course, has a risk of loss. Nobody wants to lose money when they invest in something, but the risk is there. And because every day people will buy and sell stocks, price is really a question of supply and demand. So if you think about when more people want to buy than people want to sell, the price will go up. And when more people want to sell for various reasons that people who want to buy, then the price will go down. And this is normal market activity in all markets for each stock, each each security. And the thing is how much the price will go up and down, and that will determine the volatility. If you have a price, you know, like a share which has a price fluctuating a lot between highs and lows in some relatively short intervals of time, then you have volatility. And people think about volatility only when it goes down, but it's same. I mean, volatility is the same when it goes up. So it will go up. People are happy. You know, investors are happy. Their share prices grow, their investments grow in value. And they think about volatility when it goes down. So this second part, when the prices go down, is where you have a risk of loss of money. And this is why risk and volatility are sort of used interchangeably because you have a risk of loss when you have high volatility and when prices go down. It's interesting, isn't it? Because professionals, and I found this during the podcast, is professionals talk about volatility and risk as being the same thing, whereas normal punters think that risk is the the risk of losing all your money, not the amount that it's going up and down by. Yeah, yeah. If you have something which will go up, will go down, it's it's in in a volatility range. As I said, people don't think about volatility when it goes up. Everyone is happy because it's, it's a good thing when it prices in, go up, but they think about volatility when it goes down. And if a price goes down more than what was, for example, your purchase price, then you lose money. It's not just losing some of the gains, but you can lose some of the money you invested. And I, I can give a small example, which is quite of recent. It's not advice. Again, it's just an example to, to understand. Imagine you bought a BHP stock on 16 of October. It was $45 on the day. And it went up to 46 by 18 of October, so in two days. And then it went down to 43 by 24 of October. So you first had a small positive return, 2.2% for two couple of days. And then you had an actual loss of 4.4% from your purchase price. So you paid 45 you end up with 43 on 24 of October. So this was your you know, immediate risk of loss of money from what you bought. It went up, it went down, it went down more than what you purchased, so you lost money. So volatility is normal. It's about how much, you know, how big is this volatility, how much can go up and down and how often as well. This is what will impact the risk of loss. So if you want to think about maybe long term, Ideally, you want your investment to have a positive growing trend. This is, you know, ideal. No volatility, it just grows up. Everyone is happy. But that's not possible. So there will be some volatility. And you can think about the risk as this probability of not getting that constant increase. 
So the fluctuations, this up and down, the down part of the price, so when it goes down, will actually eat a bit from your earnings when it went up. So you will get less long term if you have a high volatility because of this down part of the price eating from the up part of the price increase. So you'll end up with a lower value long term than if you have a low volatility for the same return, annual return. It's it's all mathematics. (laughs) It is, and I should mention as well that yeah. you are a highly qualified mathematician, and so this is yeah. you, you'll actually Computer love science, the numbers. I'd say, yeah, <laughs> Computer science, but it, it is math as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you do love mathematics and um, <laughs> yes, what it, it what it shows. You mentioned asset classes previously, and that there's different volatility profiles for different a- asset classes. Can you just quickly run us through an overview of what they might be? Before. Talking about that, I would say first that investors will need to look at individual investment volatility and for overall portfolio volatility compared with just looking at asset classes. But indeed, everyone, you know, for example, cash is, has less risk than bonds and bonds have less risk than property and property have less risk than stocks. So when you invest in something like you invest in property, you expect to be the price and the volatility of those you know, properties, prices going up and down over market in different locations, different suburbs and so on. Do you expect that volatility to be lower than volatility of shares, for example, of And of course, cryptocurrencies are much more volatile than shares. So people have this understanding of different asset types having different risks, which comes from this volatility of prices going up and down. But I would say that we need to look at individual investments because even in in the same asset class and let's say in the same industry, different securities could have different volatilities. So you can think about these asset classes as, you know, you have a bit of cash and you have some property and you have some shares and maybe you want to tap into a bit of crypto, but you cannot make a accurate assessment of your total risk just by looking at the high level asset classes. You need to go and look at individual. And as I mentioned, for example, in, in materials, you can have, for example, again, not endorsing any of these stocks, it's just example. Amcor has 18% volatility, expected volatility at this stage in November a few days ago. James Hardy, Blue Scope, 32%, BH period into 28%. So there are some differences between volatilities of investments, even in the same asset class. So you need to go a bit more granular and people need to look at individual investments. What's the risk of each? I mean, the risk of loss for each due to high volatility. And then look overall, what's the risk of loss for the entire portfolio due to individual volatilities coming together, I would, I would say. So it's much more good to start with high-level asset classes and have this kind of split in your mind about how much you want to invest in different asset classes with different levels of risk. But you also need to go granular and then look inside each asset class. What's the volatility of individual? Well, let's say property. There might be different price increases and decreases in property in Sydney versus Melbourne or in a suburb versus another suburb. So you can say, yes, property is less volatile or is, is less risky than, than shares. But you need to look inside as well to see what risk you take. Maybe some areas are more risky than others, not from crime risk or something, it's from a risk of not getting the price you want in that property in long term. So how is volatility measured over time? So volatility, as we mentioned, is, is a mathematical formula. So it's really a standard uh, variation from average return. So you have an average return, which you have historical average return or an expected average return, and you can only calculate volatility based on the historical data. So what we do, for example, in diversity, we calculate an expectation of a return based on compound daily average from the past three years. And then we calculate volatility, a standard deviation from that expected return. And you could expect, it is sort of normal and common sense to expect the stock or another security to have pretty much same volatility going forward. They wouldn't change dramatically unless something you know extraordinary happens. For example, I, I was looking recently, for example, again, if you look at BHP, between December last year and November this year, so pretty much one year, volatility sort of for BHP was between 28 and 33%. Or for Vanguard Australian Shares uh, ETF, which people you know love it and it's very much popular, volatility during this time was between 15% and 19%. So there is some variation because in time prices fluctuate, so this volatility will change as well. 
but it not change. You will not expect something which has 5% volatility to become 50 or something which is very volatile to become very calm, you know, to be less volatile. So looking at the past volatility from what happened in the past, you can sort of expect something for the future. And like with all, you know, disclaimers, which everyone say, you cannot guarantee the future, but you can create, you know, can look at some expectations of return or of volatility. So how are you measuring the return then? You've you've just spoken about the risk side or the volatility side. What about the return? Is that again an an historical um, figure that you're looking at? One way of calculating, which we do in WCV, is to look at historical. So you you look at uh, daily returns of that security over a period of time. And when you calculate a compound daily return, and then you analyze that. So it's, it is based on historical, but because it's a geometrical return, so compound return where each day is you know, based on the previous day, you get an expectation of return based on that historical data. So you can say, well, you have an expectation of, let's say, 8% for a stock. It may go to 10, it may go to 5. But that's your expectation based on the history. And now, of course, many people, they have their own understanding or their own, let's say, ideas about how a company may go in future due to some information they have. For example, you have a mining company, maybe they discovered some new, you know, exploration and so on. And you don't look just at the historical data. You may have another understanding and say, well, my history says I should expect, let's say, 10%. But I know based on some other information, and I think it may be 15% or 20%. You know, so just an example. So it's important to look at the historical, but in diverse view as well, you have the ability to enter your own preference or your own knowledge about the future return and calculate based on that. And volatility, it's calculated based on this uh, expectation of return. Mm. How do you put in your own thoughts on future returns or volatility? In diverse view or in general, you mean? No, in diverse view. So in diverse view, we have an option where you can analyze. So you enter your stocks, your securities, stocks, ETF, whatever you have in your portfolio. You enter them and then you have an option. You run with a calculated diverse view returns and then you have an option to enter the expected return for each individual investment and recalculate with that. So we still say that the volatility is the diverse view calculated volatility, so based on historical data. But you can enter your own expected return and then recalculate for the entire portfolio where some of your investments, maybe not all, but some may have, you know, your other expectation of return, not just the historical calculation. So this measure, we're only talking about a single stock at the moment, but then the picture becomes far more complex when you start introducing two or three or even more stocks in a portfolio. How many combinations are possible mathematically? Oh, many. I like, I, like hearing, I like hearing these big numbers. <laughs> big numbers, yes. Many. So if you think about for two stocks, let's do it. take two stocks and you imagine just 1% increment. So you can have 1% in one stock, 99 in the second. 2% in one stock, 98 in the second. Yeah, so you have this 99 combination. And as I've said, just one stock, 1% increments. You, if you have decimals, you know, 0.5 and it's it, many more combinations. But if we stick with 1% increments, for two, you have 99 combinations. For three stocks, you have 4,851 combinations. For four stocks, you already have over 150,000 combinations. For five stocks, it's more than 3,700,000 combinations. So imagine, you know, go, go to 10, 20, whatever people have, maybe 25 stocks on 13 their portfolios. The number of ways in which you can combine these stocks percentage-wise it's huge as your portfolio grows. And even for three or four, it is something, you know, you cannot go through all of this in, in Excel and try to figure out for each what's the return and what's the risk for each combination. Because the weights are very important in both portfolio returns, overall portfolio return, what you expect to return to get, and also the overall portfolio risk. And formula for return is a bit, you know, simpler. It's just a weighted average of individual expected returns. But for portfolio risk, volatility of your entire portfolio, it's much more complex. And it's quite difficult to calculate even for three, four, five. We can do it, but you know, it takes time. And it also requires information about correlations between these stocks, which we can t- talk about as well. But oh, what I can't, wait to, can't <laughs> wait to talk about correlation as well. <laughs> yeah. But what I wanted to say is as your portfolio grows, 
the number of ways you can combine your securities grows a lot. So it's not feasible to do it by hand or in Excel or whatever way. To, for each combination, you have to go and calculate the total portfolio risk and total portfolio return. And then look at all of them and see, oh, look, this combination is, is best for me or for whatever you know goal you have. Because your goal is a financial goal. Let's say you want to get whatever millions by retirement, but you also want to sleep at night. So you want to have a low risk. And this is another or thing. Or a low vol- 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 volatility. Low volatility, yes. So yeah. low, mm-hmm. low risk of loss. You don't want to lose money along the way. So, And this is not impossible to have a, a good return and low volatility. So because this can be co- combined in so many ways, how do you calculate first and how do you choose le- uh, then what combination is best for you? Because it becomes uh, quite impossible to do by hand or you know, humanly possible. So this is why we build this technology to, to help people calculate. So look through all this combination and then figure out, you figure out, you as a user, I mean, uh, figure out what, which of them will work best for you. Yeah, because most people, when they're putting a portfolio together, they just simply go, oh, well, I've got 15 stocks, so, you know, divided by 15, 100 divided by 15 for no, each one. No, it's not that. But, mm. but they, the weightings for each of those companies is really important, isn't it? It's very important. And there is a lot of research also showing that the main driver of your return long term is how you combine your investments. And this is something I want to you know, transmit to people and people who will watch this podcast is that it's very important how you combine them, not what you choose. So it's very important, of course, what investments you choose to invest your money in. But then the second step is how do you combine them? Because the way you combine them will impact your return and will also impact your risk. And as I mentioned earlier, having a high volatility to eat up from your gains long term, so it will get you less money long term compared with a portfolio which has a you know, good return and low volatility. And how you find it, this is what we do in diversity. We show you all this, you know, this picture and then you figure out, you know, what you want to get. We will not yep. tell you how to combine them. It's up to you as a user to choose what's best for you. Okay. I think this might be a good point to introduce the efficient frontier. Yes. Um, <laughs> now, I'm tempted when we discuss this to leave out the risk-free rate part of the calculation. Is it possible to do that, just to simplify it before we introduce the risk-free rate? Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, the the efficient frontier means the set of, so we spoke of uh, many combinations for your securities, millions, uh, if you you go to a a big portfolio. A subset of these combinations will have the best return for a level of risk. So imagine in all these millions of combinations, you can have some of these combination of weights which have the same same risk, let's say, uh, just saying 20% volatility. And some of these combinations will, will have a better return for that risk, 20%, or some of them will have a lower return for that 20% risk. So what you want is the, the one which has the highest return for the le- that level of risk. So it's a bit difficult to explain with our visual, <laughs> but when you when well, you we can we'll put a link in the um, the episode notes to the website where we can yes, uh, we've got yes. uh, plenty of explanations about yes, this and what yes. it looks so, like because it kind of looks like an upside down Nike symbol, doesn't it? The uh, <laughs> sort the of yes, yeah, the kind efficient of, yeah, front, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So if you plot all these combinations, you get a, a sort of shape like an ellipsoidal thing, and the part at the top, which in our tool in WCV is shown in some uh, orange points. The top part are those positions which will maximize the level of return for a given level of risk. And we can help you calculate that combination which will take you to one of those points, whatever you choose. So overall, when you say about efficient frontier and when people hear about this, this is not some very, you know, I mean, it is a complex mathematics behind, but you can think about simply as the set of positions of combinations for my uh, uh, securities that give me the best return for a lower, medium, higher risk, whatever risk I prefer to take. Investing in shares can be fun, but the paperwork isn't. My investing's been transformed since using ShareSight, the best portfolio tracking tool for investing. My portfolios are on ShareSight, and whenever I buy or sell, the trades are automatically recorded. I can see the dividends I'm receiving, and it helps me to work out my asset allocation. ShareSight are extending a special offer to listeners of this podcast, four months free on an annual premium plan. There's a seven-day free trial where you can experience the full power of ShareSight portfolio management. Go to ShareSight.com slash shares for beginners and sign up now for a free trial before taking advantage of four free months. That's ShareSight.com slash shares for beginners.
And so when you're looking at that curve and those orange points on the curve, that is showing you different rates of return uh, and the optimal kind of risk for that return. Is that a way of talking about it? Optimal portfolio, this is what you... Uh, because you need to decide what your level yes. of risk is as well, yes. don't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that shape, uh, it will go you know, from left to right. And, mm-hmm. and many people know about the shape for two stocks, which I mentioned 99. If you plot 99 points, you'll get that shape. And yeah. most people saw this, you know, maybe in school or in other places. And the risk increases as you go from left to right, and the return will also increase as you go left to right. And because of this shape, but this limited shape, which gets mentioned in many places or in many videos and so on, people started to you know, to say quite simply that high risk will give you high return and low risk will give you low return, which is not totally correct. You can have a position which will give you a high risk, so from left to right, you go to the right, yeah? so a high risk of your volatility of your total portfolio for a low return. Or you can have good enough return for a lower risk. So as I said, you cannot simply, you need to first use technology to look at it and then understand that there are so many positions that is not simply, it's not black and white. You cannot say, oh, I'll take high risk, you know, I'll, I'll just get into cryptocurrencies, I have, you know, I'll get millions tomorrow, but you can lose a lot tomorrow as well. Or, you know, it's, it's not as simple as say low risk, low return, high risk, high return. There are so many other combinations, so many gray there's all sorts of shades between uh, black and white, but you need to look at it and figure out where you are now, where is your portfolio is from a risk return perspective. Do you take more risk that maybe you need? Do you maybe, can you get more return for that level of risk than you now get? So first figure out where you are and then see what other options are, including that efficient frontier and see where you want to go. That's, that's yeah, I think the I think the important, important takeaway is, is that even if you've got the, your favoured portfolio of companies in your portfolio, the way that you combine them has such a bearing on what the returns and the risk and the volatility yes. are yeah, into the, the future. That's basically that's it, That's the it? takeaway, yeah, yeah. How you combine it is as important as what you invest in. So how difficult is it to achieve true diversification? It's not easy. <laughs> again, if you look at the right information, again, it's not very difficult either. So true diversification means that you select a set of investments, whatever you want, whatever you give you, the return you want, but those investments are not correlated with each other. They move in their own way or they are negatively correlated in a sense that, you know, when one grows, the other one may, you know, fall in price. So common example is the guy with a store who bought umbrellas for winter and sunglasses for summer. So he always sells something. In summer, he will sell glasses. In winter, he will sell umbrellas. So they are not correlated. They are two different things. But of course, with stock, is much more complex. And this theory of diversification, it comes back to portfolio risk because the total portfolio risk is not simply an average of individual portfolios risk, not even a weighted average like portfolio return. That formula is much more complex and I'll not attempt to explain it here. But a very important part of it is the correlation value between two individual stocks, so two securities. So that means how they move together uh, up and down in time. And it's very important that you calculate the correlation for a long period of time. And I saw again, some places where people say, oh, this month, the correlation is in such and such. But you cannot calculate just for one month. I mean, it's, it, you can, but it's not accurate. From a statistical point of view, you have to calculate based on a l- long set of data points to see how strong those two sets of data are, are correlated. And it goes from minus one to one. One, If you two stocks, two securities are very you know, strongly correlated, they tend to move in the same direction up and down together pretty much at the same time. Maybe not with the same altitude, let's say, but the best, let's say, strongest correlation is one. It's not the best, it's strongest. The lowest correlation is minus one when they move in totally opposite way. One goes up, one goes down. Now, I haven't seen one or minus one in our data sets, but you can find correlations like 0.8 or 0. Point close to 0.9 or Sorry, minus. What's that, what's that measure, the minus one, the plus one? Is so that, that's uh... strengths of correlation. One mm-hmm. is when two securities or two data sets, because correlation can be between other, but in this case, two securities, two, uh, history of share price for two securities, when they move together. 
So you are pretty much sure that if, let's say, BHP and Rio Tinto have a high correlation between them because they are from the same industry, you know, pretty much same people invest in both. So I could be pretty sure that when similar, one will, similar yeah, commodities that yeah, similar, mining, yeah. very similar. When one will go up, one will, the other one will go up as well, and the other way around. But coming back to diversification, what you want is you home want strong investment opportunities, so which will give you a high expectation of return, but which are not correlated. So if one of them for some reason will go down for whatever, like geopolitical risks, economic policies, whatever, fiscal policies, whatever happens, or internal operations, or something happens with that investment of yours, if one goes down, the others will not go down together with them, with that one. So you want strong investments, expectation of returns, but which are not correlated or which are negatively correlated because that combination will give you the lowest possible risk. So you can have the highest possible return with very good selection of individual investments. And if you combine them in the right way in having less correlated or zero correlation, then you can get the lowest you know, potential risk volatility. Mm. And it's important to keep in mind about diversification and correlation these days, because with many people investing in ETFs, there can be strong correlation between ETFs yes. or ETFs and single stocks in, a, in the same yes, portfolio. Yes. Yeah. That's a very good point. Actually, I was looking again recently, they were doing a, like a case study and I was looking at, uh, for example, a correlation between two very popular stocks, sorry, ETFs. And I was looking at the uh, share side top 20 most popular trades in the uh, past financial year. And for example, between uh, Beta Shares NASDAQ 100 ETF, so NDQ, and Vanguard International Shares ETF, VGS, it's a very high correlation, 0.87. So that means if you love these two ETFs and you put your money in both of them, it's simply like putting the double of the same double money in one because they will tend to go together and and the explanation is because if you look at top 20, at least, because they have more holdings, of course, each of them. But if you just look at the top 20 ones, they are all US stocks. And eight of them are the most popular, which people know, you know, Apple, or Microsoft, Amazon, and so on. So eight of those 20 are the same with different allocations, different weightings. But when you have top 20, the biggest one, pretty much similar, of course, those ETFs as a whole, they will tend to look pretty much similar, even if the rest of 80% is different holdings. And you can have high correlations as well between ETFs and stocks, or you can have low correlation between ETFs and stocks. For example, NDQ, Beta Shares, NASDAQ, 100 ETF, and Woods Energy, WDS, I noticed uh, 0, 16. So close to zero means there is no, pretty much no correlation between them. So... Again, these are examples. We don't endorse any of these or don't criticize any of them. No, you, people, you're, you're looking at these. You're looking at these. Yeah, you're looking at these like a mathematician. Just you're yes. looking at the numbers and what yeah, the numbers, the numbers. and so the data throws out. People should look at the same. So I'm, I'm investing in these ETFs not just because it's popular and it will give me a lot of money. Maybe I can invest the same amount of money which I have, whatever it is, fifty thousand k, whatever, fifty thousand dollars. Maybe I can invest them in a different way to give me, you know, better result outcome, not just because I love whatever Vanguard fund or something, or because my friends do the same. So it's really to look inside and look at them, how correlated they are. Should you, do you take more risks? Of course, ETFs are designed to be with a wide spread and of holdings and fund managers who build these ETFs will look at individual correlation inside the ETF and they will aim to have a better diversification and so on. But that's for one. If you get two or three ETFs, you should look at how they combine together. I have a, a big overlap between them, between their holdings, because it means you pretty much get into the same thing twice. So if you really want to be diversified, you look at ETFs which are not correlated or have different set of holdings or between ETFs and stocks, as, as we said, same story. If you have an ETF which has, let's say, this top 20 and you buy into those top 20 separately as individual stocks, it means you'll have an overlap. You'll have the same stocks again in the ETF. So your exposure to the risks which come with those securities will, will double. So you can do it, of course, but you just need to be aware that you take some extra risk, which may not be necessary. Maybe you can look into a different set of securities or a different combination of the same securities. 
it comes back to, to doing your homework. Are you confused about how to invest? LifeSherpa can ease the burden of having to decide for yourself. Head to lifesherpa.com.au to find out more. LifeSherpa, Australia's most affordable online financial advice. I often think about times when markets go through tough times, that you hear about fund managers rotating into defensive stocks. What are those kind of stocks and why would they call them defensive? Is it something like that they're not correlated or that they have less volatility? Do you think that's the kind of measures yes, that they're looking that, at? Yes, that will be the measure. And some fund managers also look you know, in derivatives like options or others where you have a sort of different bets against the security, so like hedging, which is a bit more complex to discuss. But you say that you invest in something and then you invest in an option which will go contrary to your original investment. So you take you sort of you balance the risk here with the opportunity in the option. But yes, you go into defensive. I know you probably heard and many people heard about you know gold coming, you know, many funds investing in gold now, many more superannuation funds investing in gold or other commodities for the same reason because it's sort of seen as a lower risk, long term play against some of more risky securities on the market. Bonds, again, everyone heard about bonds being suddenly more volatile than people thought they would be. And that comes again from geopolitical things uh, happening and some countries becoming, you know, having a higher debt than ours and not being able to serve their debt bonds. So things are not stable. Uh, and every now and then you need to have a look at your portfolio and, and see if you want. Maybe you should not, but if you want and Maybe you want to change, like you mentioned with fund managers, maybe you want to change the composition of, of your portfolio going to more defensive assets with less risk or just stay and wait. But it comes back to, to mathematics. I mean, stay and wait is not simply hoping for better you know, future. Something miracle will happen and it will come back. Of course, there are things like economic cycles and so on. And we can, if you look from a higher level, you can think that things will go, you know, back in shape in seven or ten years or so. Yeah, the but, idea behind the yeah. idea behind long term holding that you don't worry about when it goes down. Yeah, yeah. Your dollar cost average into it and eventually. Into a roller coaster, yeah, yeah, the roller cost. But it uh, comes back to, to user preferences and user, you know, risk tolerance and how safe you think this approach is and how well you can sleep with it. I mean, if you're not really convinced that you'll come back in ten years' time you will be very stressed and action. So maybe in that case, it's better for yourself an approach where you keep a closer eye on your portfolio and make changes. Even if those changes may cost you some you know, transaction fees, sometimes it's good to make some changes, but sometimes maybe it's too late. If you look at long term, of course, you say, well, banks, let's say, or mining or something, they will be there in 10, 20 years time. But you never know what if you retire in five years, let's say, or 10 years, and for whatever reasons, uh, banks are not doing as well at that time, you know, at that particular point. So I would say rather than buying something and sleeping on it, hoping that history will just play for you is not a good approach, but it's my just my perspective. Of course, everyone has their own uh, preferences. I would say that people need to keep an eye and monitor and look always for a, for a position and even if you stay with the same set of securities, look always at this combination, this, which is we discussed at the beginning, how you combine this, your investments is not static. It cannot be the same today with what will be next June or July next year. Because this, for each of those investments, prices changed, it went up and down, volatility had a, a role in next year or whatever frequency you want. You need to look and see, have things changed? Is my portfolio risk now higher or lower? Is my return, expectation of return now higher or lower? Does it still align with what I want to do long term? Maybe it does or maybe it doesn't. Can I make some changes, rearrange them in such a way, even if I don't sell or buy anything else, I'm st you know, stick with my preferred, with my loved uh, securities, but can I combine them in a different way to get a better return? So, yeah, I don't believe in buying something and sleeping on it. I think people need to be a bit more active, not the opposite as well, not to exaggerate and yeah, always stay on it. Yeah, not to trade completely. <laughs> not to trade completely. But just to use the mathematics. Yeah, use mathematics to have a look from time to time, if it's quarterly or half yearly or yearly, and see where you are and what you can do better from that point onwards. 
And here I want to make a point, and probably some people will not agree with me, but there is a concept of rebalancing to original weights, which many people use in, uh, with their model portfolios. And the tendency is to go back to what you calculated first time. So let's say you create a excellent portfolio now or optimal combination everything is perfect and maybe in some time you will go and say all oh, they their values because of volatility have changed so i want to bring them back to the original weights which i calculated and I because don't think all of those weightings will change over time yeah, won't so, they you know yeah. some will go up some will go down and yes, suddenly yes. you'll have a 10 percent here and a yeah five yeah. percent there so yeah. Forth, yeah but the practice in, in industry let's say it is to bring them back to the original weights and that may not be correct in all cases, maybe in some cases, but not every portfolio will have the same. Because the po- your position, when you recalculate your optimal allocation at that time, may be different from what was optimal when you calculated the first time. So you need to hear when those changes happen and you notice some you know, deviations from your targets, it's not necessarily better to go back to the targets which you had last year or half a year ago, is what's best is to calculate the new... The optimal, the optimal, yeah, optimal portfolio. There. Yeah, like yeah. you are new there. You don't know about the past. You say, well, this is my situation now. What's best now? And yeah, because it's so thing. arbitrary. It's so arbitrary just to say, oh, I want to go back to yes. you know, yeah. Yeah. 10 stocks, one-tenth for each. Yeah, if, if those stocks were, uh, let's say it happened that they had very low volatility, all of them, they pretty much will be in the same, you know, combination probably will be not very far from the initial optimal one. But I would say that in most cases, because of, especially now with all these markets going crazy, especially now, what's optimal today cannot be the same as optimal last year and same, you know, same optimal from next year. So it's always good to, to recalculate. So, Laura, we've been, mm-hmm. this is all an explanation that's leading up to Diverseview. Just give us a quick overview of a diverse view, because this is all of the measures that diverse view use and help you to uh, achieve diversification and optimizing your portfolio. Yeah, so diverse view is a portfolio analysis and optimization uh, software, and we build it to help people do exactly what we discussed today to assess their portfolio first so first you need to analyze in order to improve anything first you need to analyze and see where your portfolio is so you help people calculate. Uh, some portfolio health indicators like uh, expected uh, return, volatility, sharp uh, ratio, beta, alpha. I'm not sure if we have time to speak about those, but some indicators about how your portfolio looks now. And then we show you those potential combinations that we discussed, you know, what other potential combination exists for your set of securities. We don't suggest other securities. We are not in the business of suggesting any investments. We show you how those could combine in different ways, and we show you those efficient you know, position from the efficient frontier, also the minimum risk portfolio and the optimal portfolio, and you decide where you want to go. If you maybe you realize that you can have more return for the same level of risk, maybe you realize that you have too much risk for that level of returns and you want to decrease the risk while not changing the return. So whatever works for you. And then we help you, first step, you help you calculate uh, the allocation, the, the combination of weights, which will take you to that particular point that you want to be in. So it's really three steps, uh, as, I, as I call it. You first analyze, then you discover other possibilities, and then you do this optimization with the aim to increase your chances of good return long term. And diversification comes into play, and we also help show you the granular diversification between individual investments. Because, as I mentioned, it's important to look not just high-level asset classes. You can find lots of pie charts everywhere about different allocation on industries, but it's important to look at the individual correlations because, as we gave some examples, you can have strong correlations between securities, being ETFs, SOCs, whatever. And all those features that we have are all with the same aim, to help you decide better for your own portfolio. Without uh, giving financial advice, we help you with technology to do all these calculations, which cannot be done by hand or in or in Excel, because it's quite impossible, to be honest. And because it's so difficult and so impossible to do it by hand, people sometimes just skip them and just take the decisions based on common sense. But sometimes they are not as good as being based on the actual data. So diversity view, this is the main role to help you analyze and then optimize your portfolio. 
So we'll put some links in the episode notes and the blog post where you can find more information about Diverseview and also a page on the Shares for Beginners website where you can look at another video that were a couple of videos that we've put together to give you some more deeper understanding of Diverseview and also a special deal for listeners to this podcast. Yes. Dr. Laura Rusu, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you very much, Phil, and I hope your listeners found this very useful and interesting. And for any questions, so always welcome their questions and feedback. And uh, yeah, happy, happy investing and optimizing your portfolio. Thanks for listening to Shares for Beginners. You can find more at sharesforbeginners.com. If you enjoy listening, please take a moment to rate or review in your podcast player or tell a friend who might want to learn more about investing for their future. 